Good morning, everybody, to this, to the invited, to today's invited talk, which will not be given by Don Quixote, but <laughs> by Hans von Wittmarsch, who is standing next to me. So Hans actually received his PhD in 2000 from the University of, of Groningen, and uh, since then he's got he's gotten around quite a lot. So you've held it. <laughs> You, you, you have a, a professorship in what the equivalent in, in New, Zealand, New Zealand for quite some time. You've been in Scotland, in Spain, in France, and coming back and forth. And now I think that, now you, perhaps you start settling in, in Lorraine. Yeah. And Lorraine actually he's he's the CFS and he's having a, a research group called Cello. And actually when I looked it up, Cello, I thought what's an, since you you know that I'm also an acronym, so I wanted to find out about the acronym. And it's about computational dynamic logic. In, in Lorraine, and so okay, I was putting the region inside, so some of this is a bit forced, this acronym. And I look further in his CV, and actually he's a dedicated cello player. But it fits perfectly that he also combines <coughs> this with, uh, with his research. And uh, yeah, actually, last time I've seen actually was on the soccer field. So we were at a dark school seminar, and we played soccer together. And then you could already feel that he is into dynamic epistemic logic because he could already anticipate the other players move and stand there and just walk away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, as he said, we will learn more about dynamic epistemic logic. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, uh, well, it's simply a, a great pleasure to be here. And I hope to uh, tell you a little story about uh, dynamic epistemic logic. And um, in that story, I would well, of course, given this audience, try to focus on why I find this so, such a very convenient vehicle to convey information. So why, it's, why it has good declarative features uh, that you would like in a language. And, and I think this also will explain a bit its, its uh, well, <coughs> growing popularity in a certain branch of uh, researchers that, um, well, I think that it will have some features that might, uh, might indeed appeal to this audience. Um, so to start my talk, I uh, did need want to show some uh, windmills, um, and 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 and, and it, like in Don Quixote, um, which is one story about lying, uh, where Don Quixote travels a, a certain bridge in uh, in La Mancha. Um, but I have a slightly different story of lying. My talk will well introduce the logic of knowledge change, dynamic epistemic logic, but uh, with the particular accent of how to model. Uh, well, uh, lying uh, uh, information in that uh, setting. Um, there's actually another link to this uh, lying story, and for me that link is uh, actually the Dithmar's Tale of Wonders, given my name. So, um, um, <coughs> when I grew up, which was in Holland, by the way, then um, you are uh, being read the Grim Fairy Tales, uh, which is, of course, an international classic, <coughs> and uh, part of this uh, fairy tales is the Dithmar's Tale of Wonders. It's a region in Germany, actually. This also explains my family name. No, <coughs> I will tell you something. I saw two roasted fowls flying. They flew quickly and had their breasts turned to heaven and their backs to hell. And an anvil and a millstone swam across the Rhine prettily, slowly, and gently. And a frog sat on the ice at Whitsuntide and ate a plowshare. These are lies. So this is called the liar still, the story of lies. Um, for, for some of these aspects, you need a bit of cultural uh, setting. So to have ice on the Rhine at Whitsuntide would be very uncommon. Um, even this year, when it was a very cold winter, so it was frost in June, also in Germany. And, but ice on the Rhine is, is a bit more than that. And eating plowshare as well, that, that's pretty international to understand. This is certainly not true. Um, so what's interesting, about this, that these are lies that you, as, as an audience, recognize as lies. Um, I had a far greater interest, also for personal reasons, in lies that the audience would not recognize as a lie. Yeah. Well, well, so the things you can get away with, and, and the role this takes in <coughs> communication. So, well, in, I, I will present lies of this kind, but I also present lies of the other kind. Yeah, what, the difference between the two is in terms of well, a setting where you model the, the beliefs of more than one agent, yeah, so-called multi-agent systems, or multi-agent systems architecture. Um, well, just to go back uh, to the, 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 the nice picture. Uh, so this is an illustration of the, of the, well, of the famous uh, Dutch language translation of the Grim Fairy Tales, an illustration by the, uh, uh, an illustrator called Anton Pieck, 
Bueno, um, I think there's, there's also an international tradition for classics like the Grim <coughs> Fairy Tales that there is a, a, what, a unique, well known uh, uh, translation in every uh, well, uh, group of, of language users. Yeah? So there's a, probably a best, best known uh, Dutch translation, a best known French translation, with a famous illustrator. Uh, well, uh, being associated to that work. So this is uh, Anton uh, Pieck. Um, okay. Um, <coughs> so, as in this example, yeah, it's very clear that these are lies. Sometimes it's not so clear when something is a lie yeah, or when something is a, well, is <coughs> true. Um, but in order to actually understand better what lies are, maybe we should focus first on what the truth is, at least what in a communicative setting, when agents are saying things to each other, eh, it means to have truthful information being processed. So this is the focus of dynamic epistemic logic and the most, uh, the best known of these dynamic epistemic logics is public announcement logic, um, probably named like that, um, well, at least going back to Jan Platz, uh, 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 at that time a student with Rohit Tariq and Melvin Fitting, and now I think Platz but not someone any longer active in the area of uh, the field he uh, founded uh, in a way by publication. Um, okay. A riddle that goes with um, the, the birth <coughs> of the epistemic logic is what is known as the consecutive numbers riddle. Um, I'm a bit concerned that most of you will actually know what the riddle is, um, but maybe you haven't seen this setting in the dynamic epistemic logic. Um, one other root of epistemic <coughs> logic, certainly uh, uh, well, worthy to mention to this audience, is John McCarthy. So there's some founding publications, not on dynamic epistemic logic, but on how to change knowledge. <laughs> Actually, more on how to model this in, in first order, uh, uh, well, first order logic by, by John McCarthy. He focused on a different riddle, not on this one. This one goes back actually to uh, Littlewood and was, uh, well, from the 1950s. It's probably older, but the thing uh, with these riddles is that they're not considered serious signs, so people do not quote their source. And sometimes you find an earlier one, and sometimes you don't. I find this very intriguing. But let me not bore you with these historical details, but tell you the riddle. Anne and Bill, two agents, are going to be told the natural number. The numbers will be one apart, okay, consecutive. The numbers are now being whispered in their ears. They are aware of this scenario. It is common knowledge that this is the description of the problem and, and what's going to happen. And suppose that N is being told two and Bill is told three. The following truthful conversation now takes place. N is saying, I do not know your number. Bill is saying, I do not know your number. Then N is saying, I know your number. Then Bill is saying, I know your number. End of conversation. Explain why this is possible. It is puzzling because they seem to contradict themselves, right? They first say, I don't know your number, and then they say, I know your number. Yeah. But understanding this riddle, well, that comes with understanding why it's not really a contradiction, but um, well, that it depends on the moment when this is being said. Um, <coughs> for a presentation like this, I just bang the model on you, of course, you to reply, well, it requires a bit of thinking what the best way is to represent these circumstances. So we're talking about consecutive numbers. Um, well, let's represent the state of the system by a pair of numbers such that they are consecutive. But we do not know the order. So we have um, uh, the pair 2, 3, where n has a 2 and bill has 3. Or we have the pair 1, 0, where n has 1 <coughs> and bill has 0. Okay? So they're 1 apart. Um, also, in this uh, visualization, um, we draw, uh, you might say, uh, 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 what links between number pairs labeled with A or B, A for N and B for Bill, where A means that N cannot distinguish these two pairs and B means that Bill cannot distinguish these two pairs. Yeah. So, for example, here we have the, the actual pair where N has two and Bill has three. From N's perspective, this is indistinguishable from the pair two, one. Her number is two, those must be one more, three, one less, one. Yeah, a different way to say this is, of course, that well, we have a domain of number pairs, and 
given the, the well, the, the observational powers of these uh, two agents, uh, this induces an equivalence, uh, uh, well, a partition on that class. Yeah? The partition such that if x is my number, then my, uh, my, my class consists of x, x plus one, and x, x minus one. Okay, for Bill this is different. Uh, Bill has three, so he cannot distinguish <coughs> pairs two, three, and four. Three. Okay, now what's going to happen? Um, N is saying, I do not know your number. <coughs> so the trick of this, and actually the essence of dynamic epistemic logic as, you might say, a, a, an interesting form of pursuit, it does, is that um, a, a piece of information like that has two roles. The first role is, well, whether it's true or false. You might say this is the traditional logical role. But the second role, yeah, and with that comes the, the, the birth of this sort of uh, branch of study, is that it's a program, an epistemic program. It's, it's something that operates on the state of information. Well, and then it can produce another state of information. That's the most natural thing in the world. Yeah, but it has both these functions. First, well, it's, it's like formula, a formula of logic, yeah, true or false. Well, it's true because there was a requirement. Second, it's a program. But if it's a program, we have to determine what, what the program does. Well, it's the instruction that publicly rules out all the pairs of numbers where the information is false. So the first aspect, is it true, it refers to the actual state of the system, like whether it's true when n has two and not three. Well, this is true because n is uncertain between these two. The second role is a program. Um, doesn't refer to the state, but it refers to the model, the entire structure. It rules out states where the information is false, or you might say it restricts it to the states where the information is true. Well, where would this be false? Well, it's consecutive natural numbers, and, and, and there's nothing on the left side, right? So we, we stop at zero. So if n has zero, then those numbers can be, well, one more, which is one, or one less, which is minus one. Minus one was not allowed. <coughs> so if n has zero, then she knows that Bill has one. So saying this yeah, amounts to, what well, ruling out that zero, one is the actual pair of numbers. This has nothing to do, you might say, with what n and Bill really know in this actual state of the system, but for some reason, we're still going to need this. Well, let's see what the reason is. <coughs> and, and, um, and let's go on. So we can now conclude yeah, that as a program, this results in a transformation of the state with the pair 0, 1 to the state without. Which means that any next information fed to the system, like Bill saying, I do not know your number, what? Well, again eh, is considered as a formula whether it's true in the actual state uh, two three but also it's considered as a program but a program now operating on this state of the system yeah. and um, well it is true that bill doesn't know n's number because he is uncertain between these two pairs but um, as a program we may now wonder well where would bill have known n's number yeah. so where could he have or could he not have said this truthfully because we can rule out these pairs? <coughs> well, there is one that is maybe more and one that is maybe less obvious. The more obvious pair is uh, uh, one, zero. If Bill has zero, well, then for the same reason as before n, he knows that n must have one because minus one was not allowed. But now there's another pair given this system because if Bill has one and n has two, he also knows that n has two now because if she were to have had zero, she couldn't have told before that she didn't know his number. Yeah, but well, that's the, the, you might say, the reasoning in English, but we can also observe it simply from this uh, uh, structure because there is no B alternative to compare to comma <coughs> one. So therefore, just by, by visual identification, we know it, we can also rule out that pair. Okay, so that makes two pairs, and we get to this state of the system. Now the next observation was n saying, I know your number, yeah, which can observe to be true in the actual uh, pair two, three. Um, but as before, we can treat it as a program. So uh, there's another pair where this would have been true, which is one, two, and all the remaining states are not eliminated. And um, well, 
Now, the agents have actually common knowledge of their numbers. Still, there are two pairs. What does it mean? Well, it means that seen as a model, yeah, um, if M has two, then she now knows that Bill has three and there's no alternative, and Bill knows that M has two and there's no alternative. But if M were to have had one, then she would now know that Bill has two, yeah, and vice versa. So it's not that somehow they still consider that other pair possible. No, that it's more that there are two states of the system that are consistent with the communication with the, so far, yeah, with these four announcements. Um, okay, well, this was public announcement logic. So far, uh, is a, an example of a simple logic of knowledge change. It's a simple dynamic epistemic logic. So far, no lying yet. Um, oh, I forgot, there was a last announcement. Bill saying, I know your number, but he now already knows there's no alternative. Okay, so this is, indeed, this ends the analysis of this report. Um, that was an example of what is known as public announcement logic. <coughs> As said, uh, uh, well, going back to Jan Platzen, um, what, what defines a logic here? We need to define a class of structures, relational structures here. We need to define a language and we need to give a semantics. Okay, let's do this in, in two minutes, um, one maybe. Um, so the structures are these, the, the, well, what is known as Kripke models, well, <coughs> abstract sets of objects with binary uh, relations between them, but a set of binary relations, one for each agent, because we are typically interested in modeling knowledge of different agents and what they know about each other, as in the written. Yeah. Relational structures. Um, language, well, the BNF is just something that has a propositional aspect, and yeah, negation, conjunction. Then it has uh, two sorts of um, modalities, yeah, modal logical operators, for which I use here suggestive names. So there's a knowledge or belief operator, yeah, DA5 for agent A knows phi, and there's the public announcement thing, um, so, after announcing phi psi, it means that, well, as in this riddle, um, given some uh, a truthful uh, announcement, yeah, like I don't know your number or I know your number, um, then after phi psi, it yeah, really states that psi is a post condition of uh, this announcement. So that psi should be evaluated in the model, resulting from processing that announcement as an epistemic program. <coughs> Um, well, this is what I'm saying already here. So you know phi if it's true in all well, accessible states, in all indistinguishable states from the perspective of that agent, yes, such as um, B knowing that his number is one in the structure here on top, because B has the number one here and B has the one number one here, yeah, and those that is the set of the two indistinguishable pairs. And as another example of uh, public announcement, um, after phi psi is true, mm -hmm. if on condition that it's a true announcement, in the restriction of the given structure to the states that satisfy the announcement, phi psi is true. Mm -hmm. So in this uh, example here, we have that initially B doesn't <coughs> know that N is zero, mm -hmm. but um, after N is saying that she has zero, what? Well, he knows that she has zero. So, if n were to announce f0, then we remove the right part of that structure, and this remains, and there's no alternative. Um, okay, that was an introduction to public announcement logic. Now for line, let's get back to the example. Um, and let's just take the axis of uh, the example where, well, at least the action takes place that I want to uh, explain. You could do it with the other uh, uh, pairs too, but it doesn't matter. So. This was the original state of the information, and those were <coughs> four numbers. Now, <coughs> as this is in the setting of a game, then you could be, uh, well, maybe you get a lot of money if you are the first to know the other's number. But you would still want to make it appear that you stick to the rules of the game, but you just say that you know or don't know something before uh, your time. And so there's an incentive to lie. Um, Suppose that N doesn't begin by saying, I don't know your number, but I know your number. She's lying. Well, is, is Bill going to buy that? That's maybe the question. So what does Bill know? He has the number three. Yeah, so this is the actual state. He considers <coughs> it possible that N has two, 
independence form. One less and one more. Well, if n has two, she would not know Bill's number because uh, then Bill's might be three or one. So that can't be the case. <coughs> But if n has four, then she would be uncertain between me and Bill okay, having three or five. So she couldn't know it either. So it can't be true. She must be lying. Yeah? So that says you're lying. Everything. So she would well, think that in English you have to stick to the rules. And actually you don't have to stick to the rules, but at the condition that nobody else notices that you don't stick to the rules. Okay? If you've been publicly caught out, then you've certainly lost. <coughs> okay, um, let, let's do it again. But n is what? Well, uh, new game, nobody remembers everything from the case before. n is starting by saying the truth. I don't know your number. Well, this was possible. <coughs> You've already seen it. Now, Bill is lying. I know your number. Is that a smart thing to do? Well, actually, um, I can explain this. But I prefer to keep the explanation to a bit close to the end, what I can actually do the model transitions. In fact, this is a smart thing to do. This is something Bill can say and, and get away with it, because if Bill now lies and can uh, actually continue to think that he was telling the truth, remember, M considers it possible that Bill has one, not three. If Bill has one, then he could have known uh, um, and ends number at this stage after the first uh, announcement. And um, does not it, but at least he buys that information and actually and is mistaken here. Um, but this is fairly informative for Bill because Bill now learns N's actual number from that one. And that could end the game. And nobody was any the wiser, and, and now Bill gets with away with the money, not N, something like that. Okay, um, you're excused if you don't understand it at this stage. Well, on, on the level of these statements, maybe it's st straightforward, but I want to explain this to you on the level of structural transformation. Yeah. And do this in the setting of this dynamic epistemic logic that I've just presented. So, um, you might say this was the introductory part of, uh, of my story. Now, the, the, the technical part continues when I introduce two versions <coughs> of the logic of lying yeah, in this dynamic epistemic logic. <coughs> one where the lies come, you might say, from uh, an external observer and are being fed into the system and thus processed. And another version where, like here, uh, we model lying as made by an agent explicitly modeled in the system that requires a slightly different method. But from the <coughs> perspective of dynamic epistemic logic, these are, you, you might say, perfectly standard um, well, versions or applications of a more general setting. Okay? So in themselves, uh, this is not like a breathtaking analysis uh, in this area, but it's, you might say, an application using the standard tools available for modeling that sort of, of communicative phenomena. <coughs> um, now, lying as a topic goes back quite a deal in, in history. This is uh, an interesting aspect. Uh, particularly in philosophy, uh, there's a lot of literature on that, that topic. Um, there's some intersection uh, uh, of that with the things that interest me. And in fact, it's also a very interesting topic in areas like um, uh, well, biology or, or cognitive science, yeah, where it all intersects with deception. And that's also a, a very inter interesting intersection where the logical approach has to say a bit less, actually, because um, it is then also, well, um, it is then also important that you take uh, payoffs into account and, and well, consider the game character of, of lying and when you try to get away with it but you might get caught. So this is like having a, a, well, a very highly negative payoff for a certain game that occurs rarely or only after some uh, um, effort from the other uh, agents. <coughs> um, but the standard thing is that you are lying if you say to me that some formula phi is true, but you believe that it's false. Um, then there's a whole part with the intention for me that, that you believe uh, uh, phi. This intentional part I do not model. It's, it's, it's another aspect of lying. I, I, well, I tend even to think that 
part of the discussion on modeling the intentional aspect is that people did not know how to model this as a dynamic phenomenon. Yeah? Because the, the, the thing with lying is that you um, phi is uh, actually uh, false, and you say that it's true. So how do you combine phi and not phi in one set of formulas without it being a contradiction? Well, then you could an intention operator in front of it, and then it's different formulas. Um, when does the lie work? <coughs> well, if I now believe that, that this formula that you told to me that it was true. Um, <coughs> what's a condition for me to believe you, as we already saw? Well, at least I should consider it possible that phi is true, because if I already am convinced that it's false, I'm not going to buy your lie. Um, as a first uh, attempt, I we could model lying by an outside observer where um, all the explicit operators for knowledge and belief yeah. are, you might say, uh, those of the listeners, but not of the speaker, so we do not call the speaker. Um, um, to explain that, I'm going back to an even simpler example. Yeah. Um, many things in uh, these model logics, <coughs> you focus on the modalities, and it requires very few, few uh, propositional variables, very few state variables. So yeah, let's just have one proposition, P, and P stands for our just reasons. Um, and an agent A who doesn't know whether this is true, but there's uncertainty between P true and P false, and we assume that P is actually true, therefore I am aligned with here. <coughs> so you can announce to that agent who is uncertain about the truth of P that P is true. This is the announcement. This is the model restriction. Oh. Um, and we might even be explicit, yeah, given that this is a relational structure, that we do not really say, well, this is a domain. And, and a partition on that domain is the trivial partition. Yeah, everything is the same for that agent. A different <coughs> way of saying that is that if P is false, then this is considered to be true. If P is false, then it's considered to be true possible that P is true. If P is true, that's considered possible, and also it's considered possible that P is false. Okay? So then we have a number of errors. Okay? But these form an equivalence relation, therefore it's more convenient to write it on top. <coughs> um, <coughs> in, in the setting of, of this area, there's an alternative semantics for uh, public announcements where the new information is not treated as information that is true, where you work with model restrictions. You might say more akin to, uh, to uh, sublimate instructions in, in model theory, yeah. um, but where you work with restrictions on the accessibility relation, that is so-called <laughs> error restrictions. And um, <coughs> this, you might say, is the logic of belief announcement instead of the, the logic of, um, well, uh, truthful. It, it, truthful is a misnomer. It should be logic of true announcement. <coughs> uh, truthful is, is like honest. You, you might be mistaken. The logic of truthful announcements assumes that the announcements are not merely truthful, but they are true. But the thing with these names is that you can't get rid of them once they have been used for many years in the community. Yeah. It's also not really a logic of announcements. It's logic of events. But, uh, it's not always about things being said. Um, <coughs> um, yeah, here I can't help myself. So maybe you haven't seen this riddle, but you surely have all heard, heard about the Muddy Children puzzle. Um, in the Muddy Children puzzle, there's this thing of people not stepping forward, right? Um, they don't say anything. That's still considered an announcement in this public announcement project. But it's an event, yeah, or a mob event. A belief announcement, instead of eliminating all the states from your structure where the announcement is false, or, in other words, instead of keeping all the states where the announcement is true, you keep all the arrows pointing to states where the announcement is true. Slight difference. So, same example, uncertainty about P. Well, some announcement of P, you keep the arrows pointing to P states. This one, this one. Okay. So, then it is still the case that if P is true, then the agent now has as only alternative that P is true, so believes that R is free and similar. Um, there's a difference though, because even if P is false, the agent now believes that R is true and similar. So even if P is false, A believes that P is true. Okay. 
So this is a, a semantics for public announcements, where you keep yeah, the, the arrows pointing to states where the formula is true. And well, with, as, as, as a result, actually, that you can always process any announcement. It's, it's independent from its truth. You just uh, keep the arrows. Okay, because in this state, we have that P is false here, but A believes that P is true. So A has an incorrect belief. Um, well, this alternative semantics is, is, uh, was initiated by some other researchers. Um, let us now look what the, um, how we can model lying using this alternative semantics. Um, <coughs> well, there are two cases. Um, suppose that P is false okay, on the line. The announcement is made that P is true. Okay, the, the liar, the speaker, is an external observer, not someone on the, the A model the system. What? We keep the P arrows? Now A believes P is true. But it was a lie. Yeah? P is actually false, but now A believes P is true. Okay, that was a, a good lie. Yeah, and, uh, yeah sure. So, so what does the underlying mean? That it is, we know that it is false when you underline them. Uh, literally, <coughs> like not P's underlined, that has some significance. What does underline mean? Yeah, the under, you're, you're underlining some of the things. Yeah, what yeah. does that mean? I, I just said. If I just have a model like this, well, P can be false and P can be true. But to um, well, to know to compute the value of a formula, you need to take a position in that model. You need to know what the actual what the real state of system is. I say, well, the real state of the system is that P is false. The real state of the system I underline. Uh, a different way of saying this is it's instead of a structure, I take a rooted structure. So you need a root. So the underlined state is the root. And you could have an, an infinite tree representation of this structure. Yeah, please keep interrupting me because that is for me helpful. Um, and so this is an important point. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and then given the same model, the other perspective we could have, <coughs> the other state, is what P is actually true. And then P is the root, uh, so to speak. Well, P is true, and you are uh, being announced that P is true, that also removes your uncertainty, <coughs> and then A knows that P. Um, <coughs> okay, well, the top we call lying announcements, the bottom we call truthful announcements. Okay, so we have split, actually, this belief announcement in two. Cases, the cases where the announcement is actually true and the cases where the announcement is actually false. <coughs> and then we can investigate the, you might say, well, uh, now we are done, then we already have a, a logical language, we have semantics, we have uh, pinpointed a particular, uh, uh, well, modality, uh, announcement modality uh, well, <coughs> in this setting. Now we can investigate its uh, features like, uh, what well, the typical question then here to ask is, okay, what would be its externalization, or what would be the complexity uh, of, of uh, satisfiability for this operator, etc., etc. And so, to show you some of these answers, I can do it this way. Um, well, the externalization of lying is nice to uh, compare with the externalization of truthful uh, announcements. So, if you have truthful announcements, it looks like this. Um, I'm not going to talk in length about this, unless you want me to. Um, so the, the public announcement was the exclamation mark thing, right? And we're interested in the post conditions of the exclamation mark. The way to axiomatize this is to have a case distinction by any form of post condition. So you just then follow the inductive structure of the language, and for each of these uh, constructs, you, you compute actually what is here the equivalent. So we have that after announcement, uh, factual proposition is true. Well, it then reduces to the announcement implying that proposition before. And maybe it was implicit, but the, the logic I'm presenting here is a logic of information change, but actually there's no change of actual facts. So if you have some variable p, like n has the number 2, <laughs> um, 
that doesn't change. She keeps that number all the time. That's the number she had been whispered originally. But that means that um, if P was true afterwards, then it was true already before. Yeah? Then it's being, really being relativized to um, the truth of this program that's being executed there. Yeah? And then phi was the, 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 the executability condition for this announcement program. And um, what well, we can also understand the other axioms that way. And so a negation commutes with the announcement on condition that the announcement could be done. And um, uh, belief or knowledge commutes with announcement on condition that the announcement could be done. I implies this. And what? Well, and then it distributes over conjunction. Now, just to point out one feature of this, um, this is actually a proof that this announcement is not a big deal from a certain perspective, namely the perspective of expressivity. It says that if I have a formula and it contains an announcement, I can push it all the way inside and make it disappear. How do I do this? Well, if I find the belief operator, I push it inside like this. And now the, 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 the announcement is in front of that side, and, and the B is before it. If I have a conjunction, then I push it inside like this. If I have a negation, then I push it inside like this. If I have an atom, a variable, then it can get rid of it. Well, if I have any formula, take the innermost announcement operator, push it inside until you are getting rid of it, and you will have an equivalent formula, because these are axioms of equivalence. <coughs> Do that for all the announcement operators in your formula, and then you have none left. Oh, but that means that for every well formula with announcements, there is an equivalent formula without. It'll be a great deal longer. Um, well, or maybe not. Um, just as another intermezzo uh, connecting to this dynamic epistemic logic. Um, <coughs> if we're doing the pushing here and here, you will see that there's one occurrence of phi on the left-hand side, but two on the right-hand side. Um, that suggests combinatorial explosion. Okay. So that suggests that it's exponentially longer, this equivalent formula. This is actually true, but there's a different way to do this, and then you don't have this explosion. Some sort of polynomial length transmission to be done. However, getting back to the business of introducing you to uh, lying, um, if we now do the same thing yeah, and we look at all the, the principles that model this 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 well this public lying to an agent, then they are all the same except actually for those involving the belief operator because the one in red. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, after a lie. <coughs> The, the agent being lied to believes something on condition that <coughs> it was a lie, so if it's actually false, the agent believed that it was the truth and that the post conditions were those of the, the truth. <coughs> and so that the one in red focuses on really what you want this line to be. Okay? After a lie, agent I believes is lying, <coughs> if and only if, on condition that phi is false and it's a lie, Agent I believes that after telling the truth about the final science story. Okay, it's, it's more like an adequacy condition of this way of the model of mind. Okay. I, uh, it's very good that you show me uh, the amount of time because I uh, see I need, don't need more time, but now I. <laughs> Okay, um, let's proceed to a different way to model this line that can connect up with the example I started out with. And here we have two edges. Um, well, many of the nice examples in dynamic epistemic logic are about more than one edge. Um, <coughs> P was for oranges, freeze, and civilian, right? So now we have. Um, a number of A and B arrows, and notice that for the A arrows it's the universal <laughs> relation, right? But for B arrows it's the identity. So A is uncertain about the truth of P, but B knows the truth about P. Either B knows that P, or B knows it not. But A doesn't. Whether <coughs> A knows that B knows the truth about P. And so B is in a position to inform A <coughs> about P. So, well, but that means that B can do this uh, truthfully, or B can do this in a 
way in a line for okay, this answer. Um, well, uh, let, let's see what we already had. So, uh, well, we, we don't expect light to be public announcement because we can announce the piece through well and then they um, <coughs> both believe the piece through. That's fine, but that has nothing to do with light. But we had a public line, right? So that was saying that what P is actually true, you announce P is false. Well, you can do that. You only keep the arrows pointing to the not P state. But um, that means that A now believes that P is false. But, well, B has no accessibility relation here. And, um, well, in more logic, having no accessibility relation between the means that all uh, formulas of the form B phi are true. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a sort of universal quantum phi. In, in a way, that means that these beliefs are inconsistent. He no longer well, considers anything else. Um, but that is strange if we want to model B line to A, because B is knowing that he's lying, right? I mean, it's his choice. We shouldn't change his beliefs. Uh, so we want something more to look like uh, the, the bottom row, if you can see it uh, from the back uh, of the room, where in there is no change in B's beliefs. So if B is lying with P is false, B should still believe that P is true. But B has now made A believe that P is false. Also, look at the other arrow. So A believes, that arrow, well, that P is false, but also that B believes that P is false, and that A believes that. So this achieves that A has, well, believes that A and B now share this belief in not P. That's actually the thing you want to achieve in life. Um, okay, can we realize this in a uh, in a logic? Uh, yes. Um, so we, we, we swap again again the um, the options we had, but now we apply them to uh, involving agents like A and B actively present in the system <coughs> into this semantics. So the way to do that. <coughs> Well, this describes what I just uh, said. The way to do that is this semantics is all about changing accessibility relations. The liar is the agent well, who is aware of himself being lying. Yeah? So the accessibility relation for the speaker doesn't change. What we want to change is the accessibility relation and the errors for the listener. So given that the listener is credulous, he wants to, well, without any uh, problems, wants to consider that to be the truth, she only will keep arrows pointing to formulas that satisfy the, the, the law. So um, she keeps the states <laughs> where B indeed believes fine. Um, Unlike for announcements by an, uh, an outsider, there are now actually not two, but <coughs> three possibilities. In modern logic, there are always three possibilities. Generally, P can be true or can free, P can be false. Well, formula can be true or false. Well, but in modern logic, either B believes phi, or B believes the negation of phi, or he has no clue. He's ignorant about phi. So in a way, and, and, and this is actually what happens, um, well, let's say, in, 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 in the so-called real life that, that we wish to model here. If I, I can tell you that it's going to rain in New York tomorrow, <coughs> I'm not lying. I just have no clue. I'm bluffing, you might say. The condition, well, I'm making an announcement that I do not know to be true or false, well, even apart from the temporal aspect. Um, so given that we have three different, well, attitudes towards making announcements, yeah. truthful, lying, or bluffing, we can then have three different operators for um, B making an announcement that's fine, whether he is well, saying what he believes to be true, B making an announcement to fine, wherein he is saying what he believes to be false, and, well, doing so where indeed he doesn't know that. Um, <coughs> model that in a logic, uh, compute the, the, the axioms that, that rule these principles, 
good, but surely the thing I want to do in the time I have here <coughs> is demonstrate how that logic operates on the initial example. Yeah, otherwise, uh, why, why, why did I spend so much time trying to sell you this idea that uh, A could get away with lying in the consecutive number or something? Um, so, let me skip, this is a great movie. Um, <laughs> let me skip that and uh, the two, three, five, ten more seconds, right? So this is also a movie about lying, but it's different from the grim fairy tales. In the grim fairy tales, um, the lies that were being told were very obviously lies. No one wants to believe in them. Um, this is a movie wherein the lies are being told are taken to be the truth uncritically by the entire audience. Uh, no, well, so, so it's like the opposite. But even lies that contradict with direct observation. Yeah, so this guy is sitting in a pub and saying, well, actually, I lost my left arm in an accident uh, uh, two years ago, and he's uh, happily swinging his beer with his left arm. And, oh, well, we have the, well, his mates, and uh, so, oh, how terrible all this and that. And that, and that. Well, and then the next minute he can say the contradiction, and then they believe everything he say, says the next minute. This guy gets very rich in it. Yeah. Um, to conclude with this final example. So here we have the consecutive numbers again. N has two, Bill has three. The uncertainty is <coughs> spectacular. We have to be explicit with arrows here. Okay? So this is without arrows. This is with arrows. <coughs> if you're reasoning about structures with equivalence relations, you don't need these arrows. But if you structures reasoning about structures with equivalence relations, you're talking about accurate information and accurate, well, maybe uncertainty, but uncertainty where reduction of uncertainty means uh, approaching more accurate information. But lying is having inaccurate uh, beliefs. So then we need to be explicit about errors. Um, and says, I know your number, and she is lying. What was the recipe? To, uh, to process lies, it doesn't affect M because she knows that she's lying, but it should affect Bill. No change for the A arrows, it doesn't affect M, but change for the B arrows. What's the change for the B arrows? Well, we only keep the arrows pointing to states where the information is true. Those. So, here and here, well, Bill doesn't consider it possible that n those are known. So <coughs> all the arrows removed. None, none here, this one left, this one left. Well, this is the only state where n would know those none. So we have this arrow and this arrow, and that's the only two b arrows remaining. So now we got Bill saying that's a lie. But that's a lie is a consequence of his accessibility ratio being empty. <coughs> there are different ways to model this, also ways in which you can Bill have well refused to change his beliefs, so to speak. So they would still remain consistent, but then he keeps his old beliefs. But it would amount to the same thing that he can now observe that M is lying on the assumption, uh, this is important, that the initial conditions were reliable. Uh, so that the, the initial model indeed is a model with equivalence relations. Uh, but in a game setting that's like saying that it's a fair game. The, the initial <coughs> rules are common knowledge to the players. Um, next example. First, N is saying the truth. I do not know your number. Well, that is true, but as a well, communicative act, <coughs> it still has the same semantics. So we keep all the arrows uh, pointing to the states where this is true, which includes the actual state uh, and all those here. But now, <coughs> in fact, the B arrows here are removed. So we keep all the B arrows except the one there, where it wouldn't be false. Then Bill is going to lie. Bill is saying, I know your number. So now we're going to remove A arrows. And uh, well, what's the crucial A arrow to remove? Well, um, N has two, right? So she considers it possible that Bill has three. <coughs> After this, but if that is so, then he would not know that it's not. So after this <coughs> announcement, this A arrow is removed. There's only B arrow. Okay. So given that she has two, she only considers it possible that Bill has one. Um, but if that is so, 
Well, that's what she has learned. So she now knows that Bill has won, but incorrectly. Okay? She believes what she believes to know. So she can now say, truthfully, I know your number. Okay? That's a, an honest uh, announcement, a truthful announcement, but she's mistaken. Um, now, what's the funny thing here? Well, so far, uh, Bill was a bit uncertain by lying if he could get away with his lie or not. But by and by that, he actually learns that M's number must be three or two and not four. <coughs> so so far, he couldn't distinguish these two states from one another. But here, and would have said you're a liar. Here, she said, uh, well, uh, I know your number. So um, <coughs> from this announcement, yeah, final announcement, um, Bill no longer believes this to be believes it to be possible that M has four. Yeah, so he now has learned that M has two. Yeah, so that was the final uh, announcement in that version of the written. Yeah, so this is uh, consecutive numbers with lying yeah, using this uh, uh, what, logic of, of announcements, but <coughs> agent to agent announcements. Yeah, you can call them agent announcements. Okay. Um, so there are, well, uh, other ways in which one can model this, I'm winding up. <coughs> yeah, because um, as, well, telling the truth or lying or lying from agent to agent are all communicative <coughs> acts where you take different observational powers of the agents into account. Yeah, with, lying has to do with observational powers because if I'm lying, then my perspective on this lie is actually that it's, it's, it's what, well, it's bullshit. Yeah, but the perspective of the other agents is that they think it to be the truth. So there's a general framework for this, often known as action model logic. Um, you can make up in ways that you avoid this issue of having inconsistent beliefs, yeah, what, like they have been doing for 30 years in the community of, uh, of belief revision, AGM uh, belief revision. Um, there are also ways in which you can do this where you introduce uh, less and more plausible uh, beliefs or less and more plausible states. You, you introduce uh, actually well pre-orders on, uh, on equivalence classes to, uh, to distinguish belief from non. Um, then you could even do it with probabilities instead of these uh, the plausibilities. And um, well, to get back to oranges freeze in civilian, yes, they freeze in civilian. Um, P was origin's priest in civilian, right? A is the speaker, B is the listener. Right? So what have I distinguished in this talk? Well, the truthful announcement is if the speaker A believes P and says P, yeah, we, we could do this in the logic, so to speak. The lying announcement was if the speaker believes not P, but still the same P. Well, given that we are in modal logic, there's the bluffing uh, announcement, where the speaker is uncertain about the value of P but he's still saying P. <coughs> uh, well, we have also seen the honest mistake. The, the difference between a lie and a mistake is that in the honest mistake, P is actually false, <coughs> but the speaker believes that P, and he says P, so that's truthful, but he's mistaken. Um, and, and, well, and as an aside, and we have seen that <coughs> uh, in this game setting, where you start with reliable knowledge, you can distinguish a mistake from a lie that is useful, <coughs> because otherwise it's hard as a, a listen. Um, well, the typical post condition to hold if you're being told something is that you believe the, the full information. And um, well, that's about it, and there are a number of further issues. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for this very interesting talk. So I think we have time for some short questions. <coughs> yes. Uh, while you are modeling the a domain, do we need to know all the truth uh, about all propositions in the background? Um, they are a function of the structure that that, that you are stipulating at the beginning. So, so given any uh, formula, you can compute whether it's true or false in the structure. So it's not like you have to store this uh, in advance, you just store the, the structure. And for example, uh, as you gave an example about the weather, uh, you said tomorrow it's going to be rain, rainy or not. 
So it's not, we cannot know it's uh, until it's tomorrow. So well, how okay, can you in, model in, in, this? In that sense, it's a bad example. Yeah. So here, the, the assumption is that you have a, a, a set of relevant propositions for which you assume that they have a value. And, and, and the typical assumption would be that this set is country. But the, uh, the, the, there's some model checking questions too in the setting, so then you typically assume that they are finite. Yeah. But they have there is no no um, no uh, 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 wild card variables uh, in that, that setting. Yeah, that, that that is possible, but that would be different sort of logic. John, I was just wondering whether with the operators you came whether you can model a, a double block uh, where can you distinguish it from a truthful uh, announcement? I know something is true, but and I say I announce that, that fact, but I want you to make uh, to think that I'm lying. So you know, I said that anyway, if you were playing, maybe a poker playing robot or something, you might want to, uh, to model that. Or would you need the notion of intention that you said at the start that you weren't uh, bothering? Um, I don't understand what you mean. So, so you mean that you can that I can uh, well uh, stack these operators on top of each other? Or? Well, uh, I, I, I tell you something that's true, but yep. uh, um, I want you to think that I'm lying. So okay. if I'm playing poker and I, I somehow indicate oh, that I yeah, 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 yeah. and I do have it, but I want you to think that I don't have it. Uh, I, I couldn't do it in this setting, but it would require uh, a more complex structure to model right. yeah, yeah. Would it be intentions that, that were missing? Uh, I, mean, I mean, I want to know. I, in addition to the announcement, I, I want to figure out whether I, I think you're lying or not. So, uh, so. That would help, I think, but it would, even with intentions, it would be problematic. Um, because the. Um, yeah, so with, with intentions, you can, I suppose. Um, well, yeah, yeah, so the, the intentional aspect would here be that you are saying fine, but you but actually want me to think not fine. So it's the intention yeah, for the opposite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so then yeah, that, that would be a way. Yeah. OK, then um, I guess we. Well, if it just, just an add on, yeah. on this one. So, so another indirect setting uh, in which line is interesting there is you could tell <coughs> me, uh, say, A, truthfully, and you could know that I believe A implies B, right? So you could tell me A truthfully, you will know that I will infer B, but <laughs> actually you know that implication to be false. That's another interesting form of money that you can do it. So, yeah. Yeah, actually, I was lying for 10 minutes. <laughs> that was a double blood. Thank you so much. Yeah.